All right. What is going on, everyone? Welcome to episode number one of the Weekly Brew. This is going to be a show where we talk about business, we talk about craft. I don't want to call it a podcast because I don't know if I'm going to have guests on here or not. But basically, I just want to have a platform where I can talk about what I'm going through as someone who's trying to create a business around my art. I'm a woodworker, and I know that I've already had some questions come up where I thought, man, If I'm thinking this, I'm sure there's somebody else out there thinking this as well. So that's what this is going to be about. It's going to be about art, the different forms. Maybe when I talk to other creators, things that come up that we have a conversation about. It's going to be about business. And we'll see where it goes. So episode one, I just want to get right into it. We're going to talk about how we can take something from the scotch distillery industry and apply it to craft businesses. So for those of you that are unfamiliar with how it works in making a scotch distillery, you obviously have to go and get stills and develop your own brew, yes. But what's interesting about how the scotch model works is you don't actually sell that product immediately. For the most part, you divert resources away from the development of your scotch and you spend time developing things like beer, wine, other spirits to generate revenue in the immediate term while the scotch ages and grows in value, obviously, and at some point in the future, you have scotch to sell. Now, there's obviously another side to that. I know there are many scotch distilleries that use a different model where they go from making the scotch to having a test room where people can come in and enjoy the freshly made scotch form of market research. There's a myriad of reasons to do that, but I want to focus on the concept of scotch distillers who are diverting resources away from their main art, we'll call it. And the reason I think that's important is because as a woodworker, you have to ask yourself, what is your main beer or wine or spirit? And I think for us as craftspeople, it's important to realize that's a job. Now, I don't care what job you do. I don't care if you go from working full-time and working part-time on your craft to working a piecework job to allow more time to work on your craft, that's fine. But what I want to talk about is the importance of having that beer or that wine or that spirit to keep you going while your art, which is the proverbial scotch here, is allowed time to grow, increase in value by building a brand reputation, obviously improving in quality, All of those things that are similar to what happens when you as a creator are aspiring to have your own venture based on what you do. So looking at that, the fact of the matter is arts and business generally don't mix very well. And I highly recommend you read the article. I don't know who it's by. I'll put a link in the description. But it's by a gentleman who talks about how only a thousand fans, but a thousand true fans can be enough to give you a great living in the developed world. And the reason he talks about that, and I think that's important for a lot of people, is it just goes to show that you don't need to have a million followers or 100,000 followers to be able to sustain yourself. But I think what's important and what I gleaned from that was you need to at least get yourself to a point where, first of all, your craft is able to satisfy 1,000 people. Second of all, you have 1,000 true people Not just a thousand, eh, on and off. And finally, do you actually have an art that will continually generate money from those thousand fans? That's a big question. Now, a lot of people who have art as their dream or goal job, in my opinion, you handcuff yourself. You started something that generally art is not very profitable, Let's look back into the history of humanity. But even more than that, business in general is difficult. Most businesses fail. If you're profitable in the first year, you are, you are doing very well. I think it's by the third year. I can't remember what they talked about in business school, but I believe it was the third year of business. You should be at $100,000 a year in revenue. Okay, that's revenue. That's not even profit. So why would it be fair for you to look at your art and say, well, it's only logical that I should be able to be painting in a a month's time 
after having not painted more than just a few portraits for friends, painting at a level where I can make my 100000 a year. That's unreasonable, and it's illogical. And what happens is you're going to take the fun out of your art. I've been in a situation before where money was tight, and I was trying to pursue a new venture. And what ended up happening, and I'm sure many people can relate to this, but what ended up happening was you were fretting so much about, man, my bills are due. Man, this is coming due. Man, this is owing. That's going to cost me. Oh, another day went by where no money was generated. No profit was generated. Let's not even talk about revenue. Let's just talk about profit. You're so caught up in that cycle that you're not actually doing what you need to do. You're not developing your skills. You're not generating new ideas. You're not formulating strategies or executing existing ones. With all that in mind, I think it's important to give your art time to grow. The same way when you put scotch in a barrel, you don't crack that baby open for a while. You leave it, okay? And a scotch that's been in the barrel for 40 years is always better than the scotch that's been in a barrel for five. That's just the way it goes. Now, I'm not saying don't sell your scotch, your art. Let's be clear. These are synonymous in this conversation. I'm not saying that, but what I'm saying is you don't want to sell it too soon. The sooner you try to monetize it, the sooner you try to sell, you can really castrate your brand quite early. Number one, you hurt a customer you disappoint a customer, it takes way more effort to recover that customer than it does to generate a new customer. And a new customer already costs more than it takes to keep an existing customer. So think about those three levels. Do you want to start off behind the eight ball? No, that's number one. Number two, things that you cultivated under pressure, are they really going to match what your intentions were when you started this venture? Are they really going to be up to the caliber of work that you would want to be putting out in the world? Or are you just doing it to put it out? As a woodworker, I see many people, and there's nothing wrong with this, but for me, I'm not interested. I see many people doing woodworking projects and selling them. And I know that it is shoddy craftsmanship, but they are doing it because they have bills to pay. Now, if you're just doing it because, oh, I don't care, I like woodworking, I'm going to make money, okay, no problem, that's fine. But I can't believe that you have that many tools in your shop and your intention was to just make a bunch of pieces that you put together with screws and sell those to anyone who walks through your door. No. When I started woodworking, I wanted one thing, finger joints. If you're not familiar with what they are, look them up. They're kind of like the dumb cousin of the dovetail. Dovetails are on all old furniture drawers. Finger joints are kind of a modern thing. It's basically a machine cut joint. I'm not going to bore you with the details, but the point is that was a precursor to me chasing down these machines. I thought, wow, that is the coolest thing. Look at those joints. Those are amazing. I wish I could make those. I can make them now. Great. When you start looking at woodworking, and I know this happens in other crafts as well, I look at tables Wow, 30 grand. Look at that rocking chair, 25 grand. I'm not Sam Maloof. I am not at the upper threshold of my craft. Nowhere close to that. So it's not fair to put a price tag like that on things that I would be selling to my customers when I know that I'm not providing $25,000 worth of value. And that brings me to the next point. Do you have beer and wine that will allow your scotch to age? Meaning, do you have a job that you really don't have to leave or work on the side that allows you to pay your bills and continue to develop your craft? Or are you in a rush to do this because the thought of making sales is amazing to you? I had a business when I was younger and it was selling fish food, organic, 100% natural fish food. And I called it Canadian shrimp mix. It was based on the European shrimp mix, but I added some things. And what I did, I wasn't selling fish food. I was selling convenience. I gave out the recipe and I said, here's how you make it. Here's how I make it. If you want to replicate it, go ahead. Every person that purchased food from me said the same thing. I can make it, 
but I don't want to. I can make it. I'm too lazy to do it myself. It's too much work, whatever. You're not selling your skill. You're selling convenience. Now, we get to my next point, which is the people who are selling plans. I'm always conflicted by that. Because if you listen to someone like Gary Vaynerchuk, who I think has a great stance on this, you want to give, 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 then ask. Trying to sell plans, in my opinion, is a form of short-termism. Yes, people are probably going to buy your plans. But if I buy your plans and they're not very good, I'm going to be mad that they weren't very good and I will never watch anything from you again for the fact that you oversold and underdelivered. And that's not fair. Something my audit professor told me was, no matter what you do, no matter how easy you might think that task is, under-promise and over-deliver. Even for small things, because that's where the value will come in. I have not had Macallan 25. I have heard it's amazing. Macallan 25, you don't hear about it in the news. Oh, that's the greatest scotch in the world. But let me tell you, people I've spoken to who have enjoyed Macallan 25 have said, I was so overwhelmed by how amazing that was. The experience from opening the bottle to consuming it was just pleasurable. Now, they didn't go out, McAllen did not go out and say, hey man, I promise this is going to be a banger. No one did that. But they built a reputation. And this is my final point about your scotch and your beer and your wine. Give yourself time to grow. Give yourself time to improve and give yourself time to develop some sort of brand so that when people do come after you've built it, you know the movie, you have something that makes them happy to be there, which is exactly what happened in Feel the Dreams as well. But I digress. When you're building something and you're going to sell it, just make sure that you've given yourself the opportunity to develop it as far as it can go and make sure that the value is there for your consumer. You don't want to get to a point where you say, man, I could have done a better job with that rocking chair. Man, I could have done a better job with this pottery work, these, these mugs, whatever. It doesn't matter what it is. I had a conversation the other day with someone, and I said, growing a following doesn't help you And this goes back to the Thousand True Fans essay. Growing a following doesn't get you more money. And that person said, yes, it does. You get sponsored people, and they're going to pay you more for your sponsorships. Okay, fair point. That's not what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about is when people are coming to your brand, and they want to be a part of your brand, you want to keep them there. You don't want them to just show up and never be engaged. What I'm saying is when you're building this brand and you're building this following online, you don't have a store for people to walk past or through in the mall, whatever, to be top of mind. It's digital. They don't see you until you get in front of them. But when you get in front of them, you want to keep them there. There are Instagram models with millions of followers that can't make any money. They can't monetize their following of millions of people. How is that possible? because they didn't give themselves time to develop their brand. Obviously, their strategies are a little bit different than anyone who's doing the sort of thing I'm talking about. But that's still an art. Modeling is still an art. The difference is the strategy. You have to look at the long game. You cannot go into this and say, I'm just going to post things for sale and just start slinging sick builds. I'm just going to start smashing pots. Just a thousand of these bad boys are going out. Yes, it will probably work, but it will not work at a sustainable pace. You will not have developed your voice. Your branding will be all over the place, and there's nothing worse for a brand than having to reposition themselves after they've already established themselves as one thing. Think about all the people in Hollywood, and I'm using personal brands here because it's easier than using the Apples and the Microsofts of the world. Think about the people who were in certain things when they were young 
and now they've repositioned themselves now that they're older and still everyone remembers, oh, weren't you that guy in that show? Arnold, weren't you that bodybuilder? Yeah. And a myriad of other things. Drake, weren't you on Degrassi? Yes. And a myriad of other things. Those are my points. I know we got a little off topic and a few instances there. But my whole reasoning for doing this was because I'm at a point where I've just come out of school. I'm six months out of school. Finished an accounting and finance degree. And it's big boy pant time where there are responsibilities coming up. There are bills due. There is art to be made. But I don't feel that the art is at a point yet where it makes sense to deploy an entire strategy around trying to sell the art on its own or trying to develop the brand from a revenue-based perspective. Right now, it is building the foundations of bean building and developing the strategies for who we are at bean building. Right now, it's just me. But the point is, who it becomes in the future, what it becomes in the future is based on the foundations lane right now. Not foundations that are misshapenly placed as the brand continues to grow. And this is something that came to my mind. And when I read the scotch thing, I thought, interesting, interesting. So if I'm thinking this, other people might be thinking this too. And I see all sorts of announcements on social media. I'm leaving my job to do this. I'm leaving my job to do that. That's great. Congratulations. I'm happy for you. I, th I do actually think it's wonderful. But I just want to be clear that for the people who are not in that position yet, in my opinion, just some dude who went to business school and is a woodworker, don't, don't rush. Don't rush. And if you don't believe me, think about how big Johnny Walker is. Now, Johnny Walker kind of... Go, go look up how Johnny Walker and the Scotch actually started very interesting with what happened he kind of broke the scotch model but mccallan did not happen overnight you do not get mccallan 25 in 25 days if you could they would and that's actually in the article about johnny walker they tried to cheat not johnny walker but scotch distillers i just want someone out there who's in the position i'm in or maybe close to it who's thinking man is my scotch ready think about these things before you deploy a strategy to solely rely on your scotch. Is it art that you're interested in? Is it business you're interested in? Are you ready to put those together? Art and business do not generally mix. Keep your spirits, keep your beer, keep your wine for as long as you need for your scotch to develop. The time it takes to be profitable in business is generally not fast. So do not be unreasonable and illogical with yourself about how quickly your digital art domain is going to explode. Your art style and voice, you do not want to smother that by putting undue pressure on yourself from the get-go, from the outset, because you have bills due, you need to do this, you need to do that. And finally, do you actually want to sell your art? Or does the thought of selling your art make you happy. Some people are confused about what it is they actually want to do. They don't really want to sell their art. They like the idea of it, but it's not as much fun as you think. If you don't believe me, go and listen to a Peter McKinnon podcast where he talks to a few people, Maddie and Pete, they talk to a few people about photographers who do wedding photos and do different types of photo gigs like that to pay the bills. And everyone says the same thing. I hate it. Yes, because you have no creative license. So keep that in mind. Those are my points for this week. To any of you that listened and stuck around for the full 20 minutes, I appreciate it. I'm going to call this a broadcast. But for now, this is Rick Hickman signing off from the Weekly Brew Episode 1. I hope you've enjoyed. Let me know down in the comments if you're familiar with the essay. If you get a chance to look at the scotch, the model and Johnny Walker, how that worked with the cognac plants, and the wine plants, the vineyard plants, I should say. And let me know if there's any topics you want me to talk about in the coming weeks. I'll see you again in seven days. Take care.